Hello everyone, welcome to session 6 of LTech 782, Design-Based Research in Education. I'm sure it's no surprise to anyone that we've made it to the final week of the semester. With that in mind, we're going to focus on two things in this video. First, I want to briefly review the requirements of the DBR proposal, which is due Monday, and then I want to walk through the main outputs and activities of the third phase of DBR evaluation and reflection. So let's start with the DBR proposal. As stated in the assignment, your proposal should cover the eight areas listed here. And in general, you have about a page per section, give or take. I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. But as a reminder, you can find descriptions of each of these areas in chapter eight of McKenney and Reeves. In addition, McKenney and Reeves provide a proposal assessment seen here on the right, which I'll be using to review your proposals. This tool is a great way to make sure each section of your proposal is targeted and complete. Essentially, I encourage everyone to check out pages 191 to 200 of chapter eight. Now, I know it's a serious challenge to cover this much material in only six to eight pages. There is, however, a method to the madness. The page limit is designed to encourage you to be precise and concise in your proposal's argumentation. As your instructor, I'm looking for the clarity of thought in your proposal. Each section should be brief and to the point. I want to emphasize that part of becoming a good researcher is being able to communicate your ideas effectively and efficiently. And my hope is a certain clarity will emerge as you distill your proposal down to its essence. In general, there is no right or wrong way to do this proposal. However, I'd like you to follow APA style and let the proposal assessment tool guide you through it. In terms of grading, I will be looking at overall quality and completeness, as well as aspects of your writing, such as tone, clarity, use of references, and mechanics. All right, let's move on to the third phase of DBR, which is evaluation and reflection. McKenney and Reeves argue that the goal of this phase is to drive intervention development while simultaneously informing an external scientific community of the results and their possible utility for others. This is where we get that dual focus on practical and theoretical insight. As shown in the picture, the main activities of this phase include planning, field work, meaning making, and reflection. As advanced doc students, this should feel pretty straightforward. That said, in a few slides, we'll talk a bit about how these activities can be organized in relation to DBR's iterative nature. The main outputs, of course, of evaluation and reflection include a better understanding of the intervention itself, a sense of the appropriateness of the intervention's intentions, an idea of what the intervention looks like when implemented, and an understanding of the effects the intervention yields. Now, one of the most useful aspects of the McKenney and Reeves chapter on evaluation reflection is how they outline the functions and strategies of evaluation. They define evaluation as any kind of data collection that is used to gain insight into an intervention that has been mapped out or constructed. As we walk through these functions and strategies, I want you to keep in mind the particulars of your conjecture map what you're proposing to design, and think about how evaluation fits into what you've defined and specified already. So let's walk through McKenney and Reeves matrix of functions and strategies of evaluation. We'll start with what they call the three stages of testing, which they've adapted from software engineering, alpha, beta, and gamma testing. On top of this, McKenney and Reeves have specified six foci or functions of evaluation that loosely correspond to these three stages of testing. So let's walk through those. The first stage is alpha testing which takes place early in the DBR process and involves assessment of your design ideas. Typically, it focuses on two functions, feasibility 
and soundness. Evaluating feasibility means focusing on the potential temporal, financial, emotional, and human costs associated with creating your intervention. Evaluating soundness, on the other hand, has to do with examining the ideas underpinning your design and how those ideas are embodied. The second stage is beta testing, which is conducted when your intervention is more or less a functional system. This kind of testing focuses on using and evaluating your intervention in context. It's where the functionality of your intervention and how it interacts in the context are studied. Typically, beta testing focuses on two main functions, local viability and institutionalization. Evaluating local viability focuses on how an intervention survives in the immediate context and why. An example of an immediate context might be a real classroom. Evaluating institutionalization, on the other hand, focuses on how an intervention becomes absorbed within the broader educational organization or system. The third stage is gamma testing, and this takes place with a nearly final or at least highly stable version of your intervention. Questions at this stage focus on your intervention's effectiveness and impact. Evaluating effectiveness involves assessing the extent to which the intervention meets its objectives when implemented on its intended scale. Effective interventions meet their goals under regular real-world conditions. In addition, evaluating impact focuses on the extent to which your intervention meets its ultimate goal by yielding the desired change. So there we have three phases of testing and six different functions of evaluation. Of course, we could think about these three stages of testing in relation to our conjecture maps. Early on, it makes sense to ask if the interventions outlined in our maps are feasible and sound. Eventually, we'll want to know if our intervention is viable locally and what happens to it when it's taken out of the lab and institutionalized in a real-world setting. Does it hold up? How does it interact with various contextual factors? And ultimately, design researchers want to know the effectiveness and impact of their interventions. As mentioned in the Session 5 supplemental video, you don't have to cover all of these stages of testing in your proposal. Any early stage evaluations should focus on the feasibility and soundness of your interventions and its conjectures. Now, recall that this is a matrix involving functions and strategies. So far, we've looked at six functions across three stages of testing. So now, let's take a look at different evaluation strategies. McKenney and Reeves argue there are four basic strategies used in design research. These strategies should be thought about before selecting specific research methods. I'm sure you've heard of all of these before, but let's take a quick look at each strategy. The first strategy is developer screening, a formalized process of critically assessing the design work. This usually involves bringing in someone from outside to facilitate the screening process. This allows the whole design and development team to participate. And having an outside facilitator can encourage everyone to engage more critically and bring increased objectivity to the process. Common methods that go with this strategy include focus groups, questionnaires, or checklists. The second strategy is expert appraisal. And this is a process whereby external experts are brought in to review the intervention. These experts could be from any number of fields. They can be subject matter experts, professional development experts, graphic design experts, programming experts, really any type of experts that are relevant to your interdisciplinary intervention. The goal is to get them to ask you important questions such as, have you considered X or what about Y? Common methods related to this strategy include focus groups, questionnaires, checklists, and interviews. The third strategy is a pilot, which of course refers to a field test of the intervention in a non-natural setting. A non-natural setting might include small groups of learners instead of the whole class, and it might mean trying the intervention with the researchers teaching the lessons as opposed to the teachers. Or it might involve temporary computers instead of using the school's computers, or using only one lesson out of a series of lessons. 
common methods associated with this strategy really run the gamut and include video review, discourse analysis, participant observation, interviews, questionnaires, assessments, logbooks, document analysis, and even computer logs. The fourth strategy is to conduct a tryout, and this is a field test of the intervention in a natural setting. This strategy is used to study how interventions work and what participants think or feel about them and the results they yield. Like pilot studies, common methods include everything from video reviews to discourse analysis to focus groups and computer logs. Stepping back, it's important to acknowledge that these strategies are often used in combination with one another, and different strategies are generally used at different stages in the life cycle of a project. Now, what we can do is crosswalk the stages of testing, the various functions of evaluations, and the four main strategies of evaluation. What results is a sort of map that allows us to think about what role evaluation should play and what form it should take across the iterative cycles of design-based research. The blue squares indicate frequently useful combinations of functions and strategies, whereas the light green cells indicate combinations of functions and strategies that may be useful depending on the circumstances. In closing, I know this is a lot to take in, but I hope this walkthrough of the functions and strategies of evaluation helps you think about the role evaluation should play in your design-based research proposal. Okay, everyone, we're out of time for today. Have a great week, and I'll see you in Canvas.